The following is a production of Shark Flight Media. Now entering the nexus of geekery and guy world in three, two, one, mark. Do you know what the secret of life is? One thing, just one thing. You know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. This is the Dudes in Hyperspace podcast. Hey, kids, welcome back to another exciting edition of the Dudes in Hyperspace podcast. I am your host, Ian J. Malone, joined momentarily by one of my partners in crime. Rob Howell has the night off. Went to the bullpen to grab ourselves a sub, so stick around for that. Before we get into that, though, got to pay some bills. Say thanks to our sponsors, man. That, of course, starts with the fine folks at Chris Kennedy Publishing as they present this show. If you want, uh, doesn't matter what you're into, guys, military, sci-fi, space opera, urban fantasy, heck, even paranormal romance, stuff about the craft. It's all got it all for you. ChrisKennedyPublishing.com. Go there, read about their books, their series, their authors, even sign up for their newsletter. If you haven't already, get yourself a free ebook in the process. It's all happening right there at ChrisKennedyPublishing.com. Why? Because they are message free sci fi with a slice of fantasy. Rob Howell, how are we doing this evening, my friend? I'm doing great. I am uh, excited. Mostly set up for Planet Comic Con, which I'll talk about here in a moment. And, uh, Boy, it's really nice to have a big show again. It's been too long, and so I, I'm really pumped up. And, you know, it was one of those weeks of a uh, bunch of work done, and I know it's a bunch of work, and but it's not it, – there's times that you do a bunch of work and you don't actually see right. the the progress. Uh, so Planet Comic Con is perfect because I did a bunch of work. I know I did a bunch of work, but now Planet Comic Con, I get a chance to show that – you know, get it. I'll have instant gratification. I guess is what I'm gonna, what I'm aiming at there. Nice. Well, as noted at the uh, the outset, there we are down one Kevin Steverson this evening. Uh, our thoughts go out to him. Um, his a very good friend, close friend of his, had a death in the family, so he is traveling this evening to uh, to be able to attend the funeral. So uh, anyway, thoughts and prayers go out to those folks and uh, safe travels to Kevin and, and his crew as they go to to be there for their friends. Man, that's what it's all about. So uh, in the meantime, we decided we grab ourselves a sub on the night and we have with us none other than the man with the grand poobah hat makes his grand return todd fonestock what's up man how are you hey uh i'm doing great thanks so much for having me on the show again it's uh it's always fun to uh hang and chat with you guys no problem man i swear we tried to get grand poobah hat trending on twitter after that episode <laughs> the last time you we were on like we were so close i felt like it was right there <laughs> I'm so mystified why that didn't uh, just run. I, I don't know why. <laughs> well, you know, they say on social media nowadays to get anybody's attention, you have to be more visual. So maybe what we needed to do is just CGI a Grand Poobah hat onto your face. Or I could just, just buy one. That. Where does one get a Grand Poobah hat? I should just go get one. We should make what do you hat. think the odds are there'll be a Grand Poobah hat at Planet Comic Con? I would say high. I'd oh, say the odds epic. are good. Please tag Shark Flight Media with hashtag dudes in hyperspace. If that becomes reality, folks, I will love you forever. This, friends, is Todd Fonestock, author of the Elder series, wearing his grand poobah hat at Planet Comic Con. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Well, as we uh, typically do to kick off the show, we've got news and updates from the world of writing and books. So let's get on to that with our news segment, shall we? And now the news. Rob, in talking to you on the air, uh, sounds like you've got a lot of stuff happening in your world. Planet Comic Con obviously happening, but got some new releases coming out, whether it's with you, new mythology, lots of stuff happening with you. So I'm going to let you lead off, man. What's in the news in the world of Rob Howe? Well, as I mentioned, uh, Planet Comic Con this weekend, it's uh, one of those big, you know, 70,000 people coming through kind of shows. And it's it's. It's really a great honor to be a part of it. They, they've treated us so well over the years. Um, the people who run it do a great job. And uh, I, I've made money there. I've met a lot of friends, and I've, I've had a great time. Uh, I'm also excited because on the 10th of May, so like three weeks away, uh, The Door into Winter comes out. Uh, this is the next Eldritch Legacy novel, so it's the fourth in the series. Uh, I'm really proud of how it came out. Uh, you get to an editing stage and you go, oh, this is terrible. This is terrible. Oh, wh what kind of idiot am I, I think I can write? And you go through that stage and uh, suddenly you realize, okay, so I needed to fix this thing. And once you fix that thing, then, oh, that part's smooth. And you go through that stage and you fix all those those crazy, those, those plot holes, I guess it's the easiest way to describe it. And I, I remember going through this particular editing process and I had a great help from Wesley Bridgewater 
who is coming on to new mythology to help with this this very thing. And she caught some things that I didn't see either. I remember coming out of the ad editing process going, oh, this really is a strong book. It's got tension and it's got romance and it's got intrigue and it's got adventures. And I try at the end when, you know, this happens and that happens. And uh, the the way the battle ended, you know, the way the epic battle ended was not necessarily an obvious way for it to end. And that sort of just happened in the process of writing the story. So I, I'm really excited about how this book came out. So Door into Winter coming out on the 10th. Uh, but right now, this weekend, we're really focused on Planet Comic Con and going out and talking about you know, new mythology and the Elder's Legacy. And then, of course, all my stuff in the Four Horsemen universe and, and all my stuff that I've done over the years. Uh, it's actually starting to become a challenge to fit all my books onto a six-foot table, which is a nice problem to have, I have to sure, say. Sure, no doubt, man. Todd, about you, man? What's uh, what's happening in the world of Fauna Stock these days? Uh, it's been a bit of a whirlwind. I um, I jumped out of the gate in the beginning of the year writing on the Kaiven the Unkillable sequel, and um, I've just got a lot of really cool irons in the fire. Um, I've got this cool project I'm working on that has to do with puzzle boxes that I'll be moving on to next, and I've got the third in a trilogy. Um, not in the Elder's Legacy that I got to work on, plus um, the uh, Tower of the Four series, which was a uh, uh, Colorado Authors League award winner last year. Um, I've got to continue that series. So there's plenty on my plate, not to mention um, the uh, I've got a, a series, like a um, middle grade series called The Wishing World, which was um, pretty big in its day. And I just recently got the rights back from Tor. So I'll be re-releasing that, the first two books in that series, plus a third that I wrote um, uh, a couple years ago and then sat on because I couldn't get the rights back. So I'll be re releasing a, a trilogy, trilogy of Wishing World books very soon. Awesome. So lots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were a busy guy. Um, well, I've got a little bit of news to drop on my stuff. Uh, I typically come on here and say, oh, sure, I've made progress on Last Argonaut, which uh, is a book that's coming out in, in the Steverson's Salvage Title universe. And, you know, I've had updates and word counts and all that good stuff. And now I'm happy to report the draft one is in the can. Nice. Uh, so I put, put the wraps on that this week. It's currently sitting about 75,000 words. And I would wager knowing my process and kind of how that plays out. Draft two typically grows by about 25, 30 percent. So that one will tap out somewhere around 100, 110,000, I'm guessing. Uh, and it's mainly just because this is the first book I've written in quite a while that's a that's a double POV. So uh, we we have the perspectives from the the coach and from kind of the 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 will be star player in this one. But um, really excited about getting into draft two on this one, guys. It's uh, it's kind of one of those things that you start out thinking a story is going to be this. And you structure it and you outline it and, and you're really excited about it and you get rolling. And then as always inevitably happens, creativity takes hold and things start to go in directions that you never intended. And that's awesome. It makes for a great story. Um, in the meantime, though, you know, it means that in draft two, you've got quite a bit of cleanup to do. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, yeah, that's that's what I got to start on whenever I get back from uh, from the anniversary trip. And But I'm excited about it. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, by the time I, I cracked the end it and I, you know, and wrote the, the magical words at the end, I was really happy with what it became. So, and you should be. I mean, that is that's that's always such a, a, a wonderful feeling to know that you've at least you know it has to work. It, it has worked, but you've done something and now you get to make it pretty, but you've done something. But I have to ask you uh, a couple of important questions here. How many references to the replacement and the longest <laughs> yard did you th throw into this? <laughs> there, there are a few Todd. This is a, uh, this is a sports book with aliens and other worlds. Like it's oh, we, cool. we, in salvage title. One of the things in, in popular culture there, right. Is this game that everybody watches called war ball. And it's been referenced numerous times. Everybody knows it's super violent. It's some sort of hybrid thing between like football, MMA and hockey and maybe like rugby, but nobody's ever really seen it before. And so my job is to tell a story that's set in this league that not only showcases you, you know, what professional war ball looks like at the highest level, but also tells a story. So, uh, that sounds awesome. so, so I, I get to tell the story and I get to create a sport and like write a playbook all in one novel. So that's, nice. that's been a challenge, but it's been fun. Um, when does it come out? 
I'm uh, shooting for later on this fall. Uh, if I start on it, when I start on it, when I get back, uh, that'll be second week in May. Hoping to have it, uh, hoping to have it done and, and off to edit by early summer, and then from there, it's up to the publisher on when it when they want to drop it. Uh, so I would I would wager probably sometime in the fall. But um, but anyway, but to your question, Rob, uh, I mean, there are definitely some some, you know, some <laughs> themes and, and some things in there that fans of those movies will pick up on. But I mean, really, what became so much fun about this one was the the world that I'm on. And for folks who have read the um, the salvage title short stories and in, in the three anthologies that I'm in, you, you get a little taste of that. And uh, so getting to, to flesh that out and really tell a story there that I think is actually going to be really compelling was was a lot of fun. But uh, well, speaking of writing, actually, guys, is somebody cutting their grass in the background? Yeah, or? right outside the window. Apologies yeah, for that. Yeah, I'm so no, sorry. That's, that's not your fault, man. You can't help it when the neighbor's mowing. But uh, but no worries. So uh, but anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it back in and I'll I'll edit as best as I can. So speaking of writing, let's go ahead and jump off onto that. We had not planned to have an interview uh, segment per se tonight, but what we did kind of want to talk about was just that, the writing process and how we do it is that we, you know, how we do what we do specifically as that pertains to character development. You know, that's a buzzy thing, guys. We, we know that as writers and as guys who have been in the publishing industry a while now, it's all about making characters, right? But what's, what's the special sauce that makes that happen? You know, what goes into making those characters that we always remember, whether it's as kids, as readers, or, or people now who write words on pages and take them to the world, you know, what is it that makes those characters, right? So I want to start with a very simple question. Rob, I'm going to throw to you to kind of kick this thing off, man. Sure. Uh, give me two or three characters that, that you would think of right off the top of your head as just being amazingly well-crafted characters. It can be from a book. It can be from a movie, a film, even the guy cutting his lawn in the background there. Maybe you want to reach out and talk to him, find out if maybe he's got some questions and be a part of the conversation. Give us a piece of quiet. In my book, that guy dies an untimely death. (laughs) Word of the day, impaled. Yeah, he he doesn't have much of a character arc, that guy. Yeah. But uh, but no, Rob. We'll we'll start with you, man. Give me two or three questions or two or three characters that that leap out to you as being just extremely memorable, and and tell folks why that is. So I got three that that come to mind. Uh, one from a movie, one from a book and a movie, and then one from uh, just currently a book. Um, the first one that uh, comes from a movie is Eben Fadlon from Thirteenth Warrior. That's Antonio Banderas's character. I really like that character because of the growth from a pretty shallow dude, a uh, kind of whiny dude in some ways at the start. Um, a lot of unformed potential that turns into that the potential comes into being. And by the end of the movie, he's such an admirable guy. Um, second one that comes to mind is Samwise Gamgee. Uh, Sean Astin did a great job portraying the character. But also, I love this character. He is such... He's not a hero. He's totally not a hero. And yet he routinely, throughout the story, stands up and does heroic things when it's needed for him to do. I love that. Those kind of characters are, to me, some of my favorites. I want people who aren't... Who are regular people who stand up and say... Not on my watch. Sure. Love those kind of characters. Um, and the third character I think I'm going to mention is Prince Rastar from the uh, Prince Roger series of books by John Ringo and David Weber. Um, his character is of sort of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the prince trying to lead his people uh, out of tragedy and into uh, uh, they've basically been driven away from their homeland. Much of what they had has been destroyed and taken over by, by, by barbarians. And he's trying to do everything he can with minimal resources to, to give them a new chance, to give his, his people a new chance. And along the way, he stumbles on Prince Roger and, and there's a whole bunch of things going involved. And, and he, gives his allegiance to Prince Roger. <clears throat> Excuse me. I actually am tearing up because I can't think about the death of Prince Rastar at the gate in 
the book We Few by Ringo and Weber, like I said, I can't think about that that particular scene without tearing up. It's so powerful because that character has become so strong and he dies the exact right way that character should. Right. Todd, how about you, man? Dig back into your childhood, dig back into stuff that you've watched, stuff that you've read. Give me two or three characters to you that really just withstand the test of time. And what, what was it that made them so memorable? Yeah. Um, so, uh, gosh, there's just so many characters that I've fallen in love with over the years, but I'm going to, I'm going to single out a few. Um, so, uh, first and foremost, uh, Tony Stark from Iron Man, like the, the first Iron Man, like I love the arc of that character. Like he starts off as this sort of, you know, uh, totally selfish playboy, doesn't live up to the expectations made of him. You know, he's supposed to collect an award. He doesn't collect an award. He's supposed to be on time with his best friend to go to this place. He's completely late he just totally blows off everybody and then has this moment where like his life starts to coalesce into one of purpose and and i love the character because if not for just a couple of aspects of his character we probably would hate the guy to start off the movie but the reason we don't i think is because of two very simple things one he's funny right i mean yeah he's kind of a wastrel and he's he's sort of this this guy you can't count on and totally self-involved, but man, the guy is funny. He's quick-witted and he comes up with, you know, these pithy one-liners no matter what's going on. And secondly, he is the smartest guy when it comes to tech that there is. I mean, like he does things that other people cannot do. And uh, whatever else you can say about the human race, you know, we admire people who can go beyond and do that sort of superhuman thing that we only dream of doing. And those are the two reasons we stick with him long enough for him to come full circle and then decide to live uh, a life that, that matters to more than just himself. So I just... I thought they nailed that transformation so elegantly that really you don't even notice it's happening until you notice that it's happening, right? I mean, like it kind of hits you all at once that that he has changed a lot over the course of the movie, and that's that's a tall order in a you know two hour movie to have uh, a transformation that profound. So, and I like characters with transformation. So I'll choose secondly, I'll choose the character Vladimir Taltosh from the Stephen Bruce books. Um, and they're real short. If you haven't heard of them, they're real short fantasy novels. Either of you ever read those books? Vladimir Taltosh? You've not. Okay. You got to well, check I haven't them out. either. All right. Uh, they're like, uh, they're probably 50,000 word books. I mean, you could almost call them novellas, but they're, they're little, little novels. And it's all about, uh, it's a fantasy setting, right? So it's, it's set in this fantasy world where there are humans, uh, and there are Dragarans, and Dragarans live for thousands of years, um, but they're just as mortal as as the humans, right? And the humans are sort of like this this small kind of ghetto part of this empire, and one of them has risen above his station to become an assassin in one of the Twelve Houses. So each of the Twelve Houses have different um, aspects to them, and one of the Twelve Houses is like uh, the mob. They're, <laughs> they're like, they're the yeah. ones that, you know, are doing all the, the drug uh, dens and the gambling dens and the, the money cleaners and the prostitution rings and all that stuff. And so he kind of fights his way up in this this organization and one of the ways he does that is, is is that he's an assassin so he's this extremely sensitive character that then goes out and kills people for money and i just find him to be so interesting and so unique and so amusing interestingly as a as a counterpoint to tony stark this character doesn't really evolve at least not in the first three i mean he's he's limitedly self-aware like he's he's aware of himself in many, 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 many ways, and yet doesn't ever look at the fact that he's a killer. People pay him money, and he goes and he kills people. Awesome. <laughs> so I love that part with Jereg. It's J H E R E G. Uh, there's there's a, a timeline, but like the Marvel universe, the timeline jumps around. In the first book that he wrote, I believe. Dude, that sounds like awesome stuff. Who was the third character you wanted to rap about? Yeah, so I'll jump out of the fantasy uh, and superhero realm and into um, the the movie A Few Good Men. Have you guys seen that movie? Yeah, I've heard, oh, of, yeah. That. I've heard of that little film. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I think the main character of that, 
uh, Lieutenant Caffey, like the, the arc that he goes on there. I mean, like it, I think it's part of it is obviously the storytelling, but also the creation of the character um, and how he goes from, from this person that you can see inside him, this huge potential for, you know, becoming this fantastic lawyer with a purpose, right? And he's completely coasting. I mean, the the scenes that they show with him in them, you know, he's he's hitting balls out at the the baseball diamond when he should be prepping for a case or or responding to this guy that you know is just really angry. I mean, like all these things that that show that he is this brilliant slacker. Um, and in the end, through a whole lot of heartache and self uh self internal transformation like he finally comes to the conclusion and i think i mean like we see him uh essentially fulfilling that potential you know and it, it i just, i love the the character but i also love that that story setup that kind of reflects real life um, I don't know. Have you guys ever read the book Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins or have you ever heard of David Goggins? Mm, I have not. I haven't. Okay. So anyways, it's this guy who became a Navy SEAL and his story is just ridiculously cool. But one of the things that he says that applies to this particular character is that human beings, even when they're pushing themselves their hardest or what they think is their hardest, are only – activating about 40% of what they could do if they were really willing to go to the wall, right? I mean, if they were really willing to, I mean, put every ounce of effort and be willing to endure every ounce of pain that they could possibly stand, they could go 60% farther than we ever realize, right? And in that movie, A Few Good Men, I feel like this character clicks into that notion like a I mean, he's fine being who he is at the beginning of the of the story, right? He's like, oh, I, I got this on lock, you know? I mean, I, I'm going to coast here in the JAG Corps for a little while, and then I'm going to get out, and I'm going to get a job paying big money, and my life is set, right? And yet, throughout the course of the movie, largely because of the Demi Moore character that um, – you know, is is kind of the opposite of him. She's got this really cool moral code and is willing to stand up to anybody about anything and has a fraction of the litigating talent that Lieutenant Caffey has, right? She, he's the he's what she wants to be and cannot because she doesn't have the talent. And he's got all the talent in the world, but no moral compass, right? And so so watching that character click into, you know, move past this this 40% limitation that he has and and really kick into the the entirety of his potential to go out and make change in the world. Just really, I, I just think that character was extremely well drawn. Of course, it, you know it's it's uh, who's the writer for that? Um, oh, geez, his name just went right out of my head. He also wrote The West Wing. Uh, Aaron Sorkin. Aaron Sorkin is just brilliant with dialogue and those catchy moments. Um, so so that does help. You know, the, the the accoutrements to a character really help. Like if they come out and they have these this pithy dialogue, it makes them seem much cooler than than they otherwise would. But but that character just was fleshed out in all kinds of great ways and then ran this full character arc gamut. So yeah, that would be another one. Awesome. Well, mine are uh, mine. Mine come from television and film as well. Uh, first one is a show that a lot of folks are talking about right now because it's getting ready to wrap up, and that would be Jimmy McGill, aka Saul Goodman, from uh, Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul. <clears throat> we all know what Breaking Bad was. Uh, Saul Goodman was a fantastic character, one of many in that show. You could have never told me when Better Call Saul started that this show could quite possibly be better than than Breaking Bad. It's a very different style of show. Uh, it is is much slower burn than what you got in Breaking Bad. But the evolution of this character, as played out by Bob Odenkirk, is absolutely nothing short of stunning. I mean, you really, really feel for this guy. By the time he becomes Saul Goodman, you recognize that yes, he is every bit the scumbag that you met. You know, the first time you laid eyes on him in Breaking Bad, but. Walk, you know, walking that journey with him from being kind of the the screw up little brother of this really prestigious lawyer who just kept kicking him and kicking him and kicking him every time he tried to fly right. You see all the adversity got thrown his way, and by the time I think you get to the end of Better Call Saul, it's 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 really going to be a story of I I hate that that happened to that guy, and less about screw that scumbag lawyer. 
which is really what you got at the end of Breaking Bad. That's a feat of writing ability to be able to pull that off. But they have nailed it. And that show deserves every award and every accolade it's gotten because of the way that character has written. And really the same with just about everybody on the show, from Kim Wexler to Howard to, to Chuck to you name it. Just a brilliantly written show. And it all starts at the top with that character of Jimmy McGill slash Saul Goodman. Uh, another one that I'm going to throw out is Joe Ledger from the Jonathan Mayberry series. Um, I love that guy. I loved him from the moment I picked up Patient Zero and and started that series. He was so perfect for my generation that grew up on the John McClane's of the world and the Martin Riggs and the, you know, the, the ex-military guy who's now in law enforcement, talks a bunch of smack, you know, has a real problem with authority, but is really that guy you want in your corner when the chips are down and crap goes sideways. You really get to see the evolution of that character through that series and, and how he finds a home that he never really had in the Department of Military Sciences and with Mr. Church and with that whole crew. And you really get to see that that transformation, to use the word from earlier, of being the lone wolf to really being a part of a team. And not only that, but being its leader. And just really, really well done there by John. That's one of my go-tos whenever I'm going on vacation. If I just need a great read, I can grab a ledger book and know I'm going to be happy by the time I'm done with it. Um, third and final, and this is really kind of a, a twofer because they come from the same film. And that is Colonel Slade and Charlie. And those are your two main characters from a little film called Scent of a Woman. Uh, when you when you start that, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. When, when you start that film, those two characters are so vastly different than what they are by the time you end that film. I mean, take the Al Pacino speech in front of the schoolyard and, and the school leadership aside. Everything that happens in that two hour, two hour and 20 minute ride is just unbelievably done. And Pacino and O'Donnell, Chris O'Donnell, play off of each other perfectly from the initial meet in the, the little garage apartment to the Ferrari scene to the dance scene with Gabriella Anwar. I mean, just a perfectly written script, a perfectly directed film and a perfectly acted story. And, um, Again, my, my hat is off to those. So, Sin of a Woman, guys, if you're looking for one on a Friday night that may not necessarily be, you know, Spaceships and Wizards, but it will get you there. That's an all-time favorite in, uh, in, in the Malone House. It sure as hell is, man. Not to mention uh, the bad guy in that movie. Um, God, Ch his name was Chet or Cat or something like it, but he's played by – who was he played by? The, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The sorry, but the the ringleader at the school that got yeah, yeah, Charlie yeah. into the trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. one of those that guy actors that's been in a crap load of stuff. Right. I'll think of his name in a second. But man, he was just so slimy and arrogant at the same time. Well drawn yep. character as well. Yes, sir. So, all right. Well, one of the things we always hear about in character development is the journey. Right. The, the, the journey, the evolution, you know, I've even seen some people and I would not go so far as to call this good writerly advice, but they say it is. So I'll put it out there for the sake of discussion that your character should not be anything like he is when he begins, when the story ends, like there needs to be a complete transformation there. I don't necessarily know that I would go that far myself, but the character journey is obviously a part of this. We want to see them kind of learn something, figure something out, become something more than they are when they start. Todd, I'm going to start with you on this one, man. What is the, sure. you know, what kind of priority do you put on that? Do all characters have to undergo some, some sort of change like that? Or sometimes is it okay just to put them on a path and let them figure it out with the readers? Um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of the transformation of the character. However, I have to confess that some of my favorite characters do not have a character arc. I yeah. mean, like they're just, they come in uh, a badass and they leave a badass and they don't change. Like look at uh, Jack Reacher, for example. Um, I mean, that guy is fun to read about. He's fun in the latest series that he's in. I mean, he is fun to watch. And does he change? No. No, he does not. <laughs> I mean, <Yeah. laughs> but one of the cool things for a reader or a viewer is when you see, you know, bad guys come out of the woodwork and surround Jack Reacher, you know exactly what you're going to get. And that's exactly what you want. Yes. You're like, he's going to kick the holy living crap out of these people. And I am so on board for it. Right. I mean, like, <laughs> so characters like that can really work. That but, said, uh, what's going uh, on? I was going to just say. I think the key here is that the Jack Reacher character, the Superman character, Beowulf, these characters aren't what changes. 
Jack Reacher is a catalyst to make all the other characters change. And it's the other character's journey, even though they're not necessarily the primary character in the story, it's the other character's journey that I think makes those stories work. Yeah, you may be right there. I hadn't I hadn't analyzed that, but that makes sense to me. Um Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rob, where so, do you go ahead, Todd? Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Rob. Well, you're the guest, man. Have at it. <laughs> <laughs> I already cut so, you off once. No, it's fine. I that's I mean, I, I myself have kind of mystified as to because I believe in the transformative character. As as you can see from my examples, um, like I mean, Vlad Taltosh doesn't change a whole lot, though he does eventually throughout the course of the books. But uh both Tony Stark and Lieutenant Caffey, they have huge arcs, and that really appeals to me. Right. Um and I and I think that that uh when I write I'm always thinking about that. I, I'm not the type that's going to probably write a book where I've got a, a, a Jack Reacher character that does not change. Although I'm moving into that with Kaiven the Unkillable, believe it or not. I've, I've thought about that parallel. But most of the time, I mean, when I'm setting up a book, I am going, okay, this character's starting here, and by the end, he's going to learn this, and he will transform. Because... We enjoy that. I think readers love that notion of seeing the transformation that they see in a character in themselves because we're constantly changing. We're constantly stumbling across things and screwing things up and then having to learn and improve and move forward, right? So that trope really gets us. So I'm a big believer of transformation in characters. All right. Rob, how about you, man? Where do you stand on the whole character arc, character transformation aspect of storytelling? So for me, a book basically breaks down to there is a challenge that the main character or characters face that they are incapable of solving at the beginning of, uh, of defeating at the beginning of the book. The journey to me is figuring out how, whether it's learning new information, learning new skills, uh, growing as a person for whatever reason. And that by the end of it, the character or characters have gotten enough of whatever they need that they can punch up and they can defeat the challenge, whatever that ha challenge happens to be. Let's go back to Reacher real quickly. Reacher cannot win that fight, no matter how powerful he is. Uh, it, let's take the, uh, the, the, the TV version, the one that just came out, which I really like myself. He can't win that until... He has enabled um, the 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 African American police officer and the uh, uh, woman police officer to grow enough in confidence and in uh, uh, belief that there's a problem that they can't he can't succeed individually. He needs those other two there. And so the journey for that is not a single character, but it is the party. It is the D&D party essentially growing together. And at the end, they can punch up and, and, and win. And so a lot of times for me, it's not necessarily, yeah, we, we can look at the Reacher character and say he doesn't grow. You're right, he doesn't. But as a group, they do. And I think that works too. Um, for me, though, the character or main characters – if they can defeat the bad guy at the start, then why don't they just go out and kick, you know, his butt and all right, well, 15 pages later, hey, let's go out for shawarma, right? And and <laughs> ha have, you know, and we're done. So if there is no, if there is no, whether it's personal growth, whether it's power growth, whether it's, you know, learning the force or all of these things, whether you whatever it is that they need to be able to defeat the challenge that faces them, they can't as a group or as a singular character, they, they can't start out with that ability because that's not to me, that's not challenging. That's not fun to read about. That's just, all right, well, went out and mowed the lawn. Right. Like, okay, fine. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm, I'm kind of right in the middle. Uh, I really appreciate Todd's reference there, the Reacher character. I think that's that's a 
perfect and perfect example of an instance when maybe you don't have to have a character arc. He's exactly right. When you see that guy step on screen, you know what you're going to get and you want it. That's what you want. You know, sometimes you don't need a, a gourmet dessert. Sometimes you just want a damn Snickers bar, you know, like that's all you want. It's all you want the caramel. You want the nougat. You want the peanuts. You want the chocolate. You can pass on everything else. A Snickers bar is all you want. That's what you get. All right. I like Snickers bars, just in case nobody's picked up on that. <laughs> really? Colonies lost that. or whatever. I like it. We, we, we heard you showing your love to the nougat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, love love the Snickers bar. So yeah, I mean, sometimes there there is a place for that. You know, I, I am a fan. To me, it all comes down to the story. You know, I mean, I I am a fan of, um, and we'll go back to the Marvel well here with with a different character, Doctor Strange. You know, guy who's a completely different character by the end of, of the first film as he is when you meet him to begin with. And he's just an arrogant DB doctor, you know, uh, the, the growth and the, the evolution of that character from scene one to close is, is exactly what you would expect out of that. I love stories like that. I love to see that transformation happen in front of me. I'm also a big fan of a whodunit. All right. I, I like a mystery. I like a good thriller, a good crime case, that sort of thing. In a lot of instances, you don't necessarily get a whole lot of character growth. That's not what you're there for. You're there to see them pick up, you know, pick apart the pieces and, and, and assemble the puzzle to figure out what they couldn't quite see at the beginning of the story. To Rob's point about how, well, if you could just go out and kick butt in the beginning, go eat some shawarma, why not do that? I like seeing that process unfold. I like seeing the pieces of the case come together to find out who's responsible, who's the villain, what were their motives, what were they after. And that doesn't always necessarily, you know, require a big giant character arc. Um, you know, Detroit City Vice, one of my books. Okay. Danny Tucker, those, you know, for those who've read the Mako books, you know who Danny Tucker is. That's, that's not any shocker to anybody. There's not a whole lot of character arc for him in Detroit City Vice. It's about the other characters around them and them trying to figure out collectively as a team, what in the hell did we get involved in here? You know, what, what did we get mixed up in here? It's somebody is after us and we need to figure out who this is or we're all going to end up dead. That's the story to me. And, and it didn't require me to, to set out the pin a, a giant arc. Um, some people might would label, I would not, for fear of getting my face punched in. If the character was real, some people would label a guy like a Jack Reacher or a Mary Sue. He's a perfect guy who can step out on the field, handle business, walk off, eat some shawarma. Besides Jack Reacher, and Rob, I'll start with you on this one, man. Has there ever been an instance when a Mary Sue character fit the story and worked? And they they didn't need to be terribly deep in order to be able to suit what the story needed them to be. Obviously, with Mary Sue's, everybody wants to point to Ray and, and the new Star Wars trilogy. I, I get that, but... Are there instances when that actually worked for the story? Yes, okay. um, but it's rare. And I think the reason why it works is because of the impact upon the other characters. Sort of back what I was talking about in Reacher. But I'll give you a perfect one. Beowulf. Okay. Okay. Many of you may not have read the entire Beowulf story, but, the, but Beowulf uh, routinely does things in the original poem uh, that nobody else can. He oftentimes says... Look, you guys can't do this, but I can, so I'm going to go ahead and go do it. I can face up to, uh, I can face up to Grendel. I can swim into the lake and hold my breath for however long it takes me to find Grendel's mom, and and I can defeat uh, her, and then I can stand up to the dragon. And in fact, at the end, when he fights the dragon, he tells his twelve thanes, "Look, you." I don't, you know, I know you swore to fight next to me in battle, but this is not something your blades can't harm the dragon. Your might, you just don't have enough might left to solve, to fight the dragon. So he is totally a Mary Sue. But the thing about that fight with the dragon that's crucial is the entire plot to me of Beowulf uh, comes out of that battle. And what he has, what he does is he tell, like I say, he tells his twelve thanes, "You can't fight. I don't want you getting hurt. You should go away." And on the one hand, the thanes go, eleven of the thanes go, "Well, he gave us an order, and we should follow it." But the twelfth one is is Wyglyf, and Wyglyf is the only one of the twelve who is named because he is the one who stands up next to Beowulf, ignores the command because he's sworn an oath 
to fight next to his Lord. He's taken his, his gold. He's taken uh, food and drink from his hall. He's, he's earned all of these. He's been given all of these things. And then now's the time that he should step up and do it, even if it costs his life. The story of Beowulf isn't about Beowulf. It's about the example that he provides to Wyglyph and some of the other people in the story. So Wyglyph steps up and he, he tries to defend Beowulf and he has this magnificent speech um, after the death of Beowulf, basically telling all the other thanes, look, you're right. He was right. We couldn't do anything. We couldn't strike the dragon. But when I stood there, underneath the dragon's fire behind my shield and it was burning me and it was hurting me and all of these things. Some of it was not getting to Beowulf. And if the 12 of us had stood around and defended Beowulf and given Beowulf the chance to fight this dragon, then maybe, maybe Beowulf lives. And we took, we swore an oath, not necessarily to follow every command, but to be there when he needed us to serve our responsibility. Perfect Mary Sue character, but the, what he does is he provides an opportunity for growth for the other characters around him. Awesome. Todd, about you, man? You ever seen an instance when a, you know, the quote unquote Mary Sue character really worked for the story? Yeah, I think so. I think I have a prominent example, but before I jump into that, I just want to like kind of riff off of what Rob had said in the last question that sometimes when you have a character that's not, you know, that, that's not growing, or if you have a character like a Mary Sue, too, that can do anything, sometimes it, it, it pays to look deeper at the story so that you see what, what is actually growing, right? I mean, like in the example of the Reacher examples, like Reacher doesn't change, but his crew changes. The dynamic of the crew changes. Like, yeah, Reacher can kick anybody's butt, but he doesn't know the ins and outs of how to get to the big bad guy and needs the other people on the crew to get to the big bad guy, right? And in the case of, of uh, well, I won't speak to Beowulf because I don't know that story very well, but like, like um, I, I think that if the main character is a Mary Sue, then the story is probably about something else. Like it's a mystery and it's about, you know, finding out the, the, um, uh, the, the truth of the mystery, or it's about the side characters and it's just a little more subtle. Um, and I think that, so that's if the Mary Sue is the main character. If the Mary Sue is a side character, I think that works very well, actually. I think that you can have Mary Sue side characters and they can, they can work extremely well. But the one that jumped to my mind that I think, might actually qualify as a Mary Sue character that we all know very well, most likely is Captain America in, in, you know, the first Avenger, like that guy, he doesn't have any flaws except for his physical inabilities. Right. And then once he becomes, you know, the, the super guy, it's like, he still doesn't have any flaws. He's just has like, you know, tall, tall, tall challenges to face. But when do we ever, you know, look at, at, uh, Steve Rogers and think that, you know, he's, he's got all these flaws to overcome. He really doesn't. And so he's kind of annoying in that respect, but somehow they pull it off. And I think, I think the reason they pull it off is because so often he is part of an ensemble cast and it's the, the other characters taking a cue from his heightened morality that really makes him a cool part of the group. Um, so yeah, so I think, I think Mary Sue characters can actually work, but there has to be some really good writing around them that is supplementing other things, you know, yeah. other characters that are growing in their shadow or mm -hmm. a plot that's playing out that's extremely intricate and, and interesting. Yeah. I, uh, I'm, I'm probably going to go with one of the biggest Mary Sue's of them all. And Rob actually touched upon this earlier. Superman. All right. I mean, how, how do you take a guy like Superman and, and make a story with that, you know? And I think one of the things that made the the original Superman film from Richard Donner such a such a gem and and you know it made it what it was was that the comment that he made to the writers when they came in and said we want you to direct this film and he said listen I can hang guys on wires all day long and and make them fly nobody cares you know this needs to come down to these two kids being you know Christopher Reeve and Margot Kidder if you buy the love story between these guys. Every every person in the audience is going to want to come along for this ride. That's where this has to happen. So, I mean, it, it didn't matter that he was really this kind of perfect character that was, you know, not flawed in any way, shape or form, physically or emotionally. I mean, he was just, the, he's the Boy Scout. But that story made that character great. 
because just like Richard Donner said, you cared about the relationship between those two kids. And it, plus Gene Hackman was freaking awesome in that film. Yeah. Still, the, still the greatest Lex Luthor ever. Luthor, excuse me. Uh, well, I mentioned Danny Tucker a second ago from my stuff, and it wouldn't be right if I didn't give a chance you know, for you guys to shed some light on some of your guys. Todd, I'll start with you, man. Obviously, we're all proud of all of our characters. We love them all. They're like our kids. And saying pick one is like trying to pick between your kids. You can't do it, right? <laughs> but who, yeah. who are a couple that come to mind as being – characters that you've created in some of your stuff that when you sit back at the end of the day, you're just really proud to say, I made that guy or I made that girl. And people really enjoyed getting to know that person. And I got to make that happen. And I'm really proud of that. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and talk about the most recent release that I've had uh, in the Eldros legacy, Kyvin the Unkillable. Um, that character, I feel really, really came together. Um, uh, and it took it took a lot of I mean like usually when I create a character I'm very emotional about them um, and that emotion carries me through the arc um, with Kaivin I was emotional about him but I was also very meticulous about how I constructed him and I actually you know wrote to the end of the book then went back and added stuff to the beginning of the book added stuff to the middle of the book to make sure that his thread really came through clearly and i think people responded to that um he's a guy so he's a guy that is had this childhood trauma where his uh his family was killed and then he got adopted by another family and they were killed and the trauma set in place by that was okay i have to be the biggest baddest mofo in the room and i need to have a high standing in society to protect me so that i can never be hurt again right um, and what he really needs is a new family, but he doesn't see that in the beginning of the story. In the beginning of the story, he's all about himself. He's all about securing the things that he's always wanted. And he goes on this journey where, of course, we get lots of Jack Reacher-esque mo uh, moments because uh, Kaivin is a 49-time uh, winner in the Deadly Night Ring, which is a gladiatorial pit. So he is hell on wheels. Like, there is nobody who's better with a sword than this guy. So we get lots of moments where <laughs> he gets to kick ass, right? Um, but on that journey, with all of those moments included, he's he's sort of slowly getting his thick head kind of uh, penetrated by by this notion that what he really needs isn't to be the biggest, baddest guy in the room. It's to actually find a place where he can be vulnerable instead, where he can have friends and trust that they're not either going to A, die, or B, stab him in the back. So um, I'm very proud of that that character arc. That, that awesome. one um, makes me happy. Rob, how about you, man? Who are some of your favorites that Rob Howell has brought to the world? It's challenging to answer that. Like you say, you, you love characters and you you want to put them into places and 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 do some neat things with them. Uh, the most striking character to me of all the characters I've made is Katarina. Uh, Katarina is not, by any stretch of the imagination, one of my uh, good guy characters. She is pure force of chaos and it, when i initially wrote her i created a character that was okay she has to be in this scene because otherwise i you know i i've, I've put her forth as one of the crime lords in this mystery and he visited one of the crime lords and he should visit the other one so okay i have to create this character okay well this just scene is going to be sort of pro forma he's going to do the things that he has he's going to check the box basically and i wrote the scene and she decided the character decided it was going to be something else that she was going to be really important to the structure of the story and that she was going to change the entire complexity or entire arrangement of what i had planned as in, it was a murder mystery, or excuse me, it was a kidnapping, and it became a murder mystery simply because of the way that character interacted in that particular meeting. It was astounding. It was, I, I wrote the sentence that changed it all, and I was like, where the heck did this come from? This is better than anything I could have come up with. And it's literally a line that she reads off and or, or that she says and and 
my main my investigator reacts to it and that reaction is literally completely out of nowhere but my my sub brain going this character creates this kind of chaos and her character is incredibly flawed she is totally evil she will happily murder somebody for a whim uh she is purely she is in in dnd terms chaotic evil but the interesting thing about chaotic evil is that if you're true chaos you are going to do things at times that are good because you're chaotic you don't necessarily care about it being uh the right thing to do necessarily but it the right thing to do may very well just fit your desires Awesome. Well, on my end of the world, I mentioned Danny Tucker. Uh, obviously, he's a favorite of mine, mostly because I never had any intention of making him into a series character. Like when I set out to create Mako, it was all about Lee Summerston. And Danny Tucker was just kind of another one of the gang. But as the series played out, he was the one that really had the story to tell. And that's why he kind of took over as, as arguably the second protagonist. And then he is the protagonist of Detroit City Vice. Uh, other one that I am just have always been very proud of um, is Trip Hackett from Colonies Lost. That is a character that he he definitely undergoes a, a something of a change by the time you get to the end of the book. And it's just mostly in the way that he looks at life. You know, he's a very, very, very cynical guy in a very cynical age. And boy, can't we all relate to that in 2022. But, you know, as he learns things about himself and the world around him, worlds around him, I should say, he, f- he figures out a new way to look at things. And I don't want to spoil it in case anybody wants to go read that one, but I was super proud of that. And I also don't mind saying that of everything I've ever written, that's probably the one I get asked about the most. Colony is Lost. It was just a very special book. And my thanks go out, obviously, to everybody who helped to, to make that one what it is, particularly my editor on that project, because she had a really good grasp of very, very old English. And I needed that in order to be able to set that up. So, all right, last question is, we have a lot of uh, aspiring authors who like to listen to the show, would-be writers and such. So, let's give them all some advice, guys. Pick one piece of advice that you would give to an aspiring author on how to develop characters. Just something to think about as you start down that road. And, Todd, I'm going to start with you, man. Okay. Um, Nobody likes to start with a character that is just completely perfect all along the way. Readers may think they like that, but they don't. Um, I mean, they've got, there's got to be something for that character to improve on. Right. I mean, even a Mary Sue, like, like uh, Steve Rogers, like he starts off this 90 pound weekly, right. And he may be morally perfect and he may be, you know, uh, always tries to do the right thing and that sort of thing, but he's got a 90 pound body that is prone to asthma and (laughs) is weak and slow. And I mean, like he's got something to build on. So I think, What I've seen in a lot of young writers um, is this desire to put their hero on the page, which is good. But I see also that they want to eliminate all the flaws that they see in themselves because one of the reasons we write fiction is to, you know, (laughs) make our better self on the page or somebody we wish we could be on the page, right? And uh, a mistake that comes along with that is making this person perfect. And one of the things that I have learned and what I would advise uh, young writers to do is uh, like, like recently I have started allowing my own foibles to become part of the character. Like I'm, it's, it's a scary thing to put things in a character that like you yourself feel like you suck at, or you yourself feel like you did badly. Um, I'll give you an example in, uh, actually a nonfiction book I recently wrote about me and my 14 year old son hiking 450 miles through the Colorado Rockies on the Colorado trail. Um, there were a lot of things in there where I made bad dad decisions, you know, things that I am ashamed about that I wouldn't want anybody to know. And yet I wrote it down and I put it in that book and the weirdest thing happened. People like were lauding me for being such a great father. I'm like, didn't you get that part there where I screwed that up completely? But the thing is, is people screw things up all the time and they identify with that. So you put things in into a character where you've screwed up or they screw up, people don't back away and say, oh, that's not a good enough hero for me. They come closer and they say, oh my gosh, 
I totally get that. I totally have screwed up and I would never want anyone to know this, but I did just what that person did. And I totally admire that they came around and they figured out a way around it and they moved forward. That's what makes a heroic character. So that would be my advice. Awesome. That's fantastic stuff. Rob, how about you, man? Uh, Todd stole my answer, uh, essentially. <laughs> Uh, uh, where, where I would go is, is that the more weaknesses you give your character, the more challenges that they have to overcome, the more, uh, the more you will, you will have better stories. So whether it's, you know, Todd being a bad dad, uh, you know, in this particular instance, or, you know, all these other things. The the truth is is that if you write a Mary Sue, you are then locked into place to over finding a way to overcome it. Um, so, for example, with Superman, you overcome it by uh, attacking Lois Lane, or you overcome it by forcing him into a decision where no good choice is available to him, that he has to either uh, let you know, the world die or Lois Lane die or something along those lines. And those kind of choices are tough. Uh, like they're tough to write and they're tough to, to put into, into fiction. So I would say Superman is hard to write as a character because where, what are his weaknesses? What are the challenges that he's going to have to overcome? So if you give your character a bunch of, of weaknesses and a bunch of things that they, they don't do well, then in the end of it, you're going to be like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to pick a, this this thing that they don't do well. Even Reacher does have a number of weaknesses. Like, for example, he's not uh, – he doesn't really know how to use some of, uh, some of modern society's technology or the way things go in technology. And so there's times where he has to have the help from the cops around him or from uh, one of the other people around him. And so – there are artificial weaknesses sort of in, in his character, but you have to work for those. Whereas if you start with, okay, um, they aren't, uh, they can't read. Let's take something like that. They, 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 for whatever reason, can't read. Then all of a sudden going through some of these clues, going through some of the challenges that they face, that becomes its own separate sort of challenge. And maybe that's exactly what, the story needs. I don't know what challenges it'll that are relevant in any given story for you as a writer, but the more things you make your hero have to overcome, the more opportunities your writer, your readers get to go. Yeah, guy did it. Guy came out and and fought against fought the great fight, and at the end of it, oh yeah, way to go, dude. Yep, nah, dude, that's fantastic as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as an aside, uh, DC Entertainment, if you're listening to this podcast and you would like us to come write a Superman film for you, uh, we're happy to <laughs> donate our services. We hear all the time about how nobody can figure out what to do with Superman. Pick us, pick us. We'll make you proud. <laughs> Just don't go back two episodes and listen to where I gutted the Batman because that, that <laughs> might turn you off from me. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so my my one little bit of advice, I honestly don't know that I can top what these two gentlemen just said because that's first class stuff. I would be just let yourself play. I'm, I'm a plotter, right? I learned long ago that I make much better stories when I take a little bit of time in advance and try and plot them out. But and I've used this analogy before, man. Outlines are like like a roadmap, all right. They're not ironclad. They just get you where you need to go. Sometimes if I'm driving down the road and I'm going from Panama City, Florida to Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, and I'm cruising down I-95, I may see a sign somewhere around Charleston that says, "Come check out the world's biggest ball of yarn, forty miles east, or forty miles west, rather." Okay, well. I might like to see what the world's biggest ball of yarn looks like. And so I'm going to get off the road and I'm going to break path and I'm going to go see it. And I'm going to be like, that's the world's biggest ball of yarn. That's incredible. And now my roadmap shows me how to get back on the road toward my destination. Allow yourself as a writer to take those little side trips with characters when, when the moment kind of strikes you. Uh, because a lot of times the things that you don't plan for, even when you plotted out a story, can be the most magical parts of the story. So allow yourself the journey and, and the fun to go experience that. And just because you didn't quite plan on that to begin with, screw that, man. Let it happen. If 
all else fails, maybe you got yourself a cool little deleted scene that you can send out to your newsletter readers and make them happy, you know? So good stuff. All right. Well, guys, I appreciate that conversation. Writers, readers, freaking fantastic. So go back, take notes if you're a writer, because that was absolutely fabulous. But that does bring us down to halftime, and it's time to do the thing with the people that pay bills. All righty, halftime is the segment where we do shout out to our presenting sponsor. That would be Chris Kennedy Publishing. Lots of stuff happening there, folks. As always, go to chriskennedypublishing.com, learn all about it. Sign up for the newsletter if you haven't already. Get yourself a free ebook. Learn about the week's new releases, which in this case comes from A. Steverson, brother Nick Steverson. Got a book out called Consequences. Rob, what can you tell me about this one, man? Consequences by Nick Steverson with Rule and the Mining Company Protected. In the Biratang Pirates Defeated, it's time for Dakal and Ryan to journey to Salvage System. Their new battleship and crew await, as well as some unexpected yet much appreciated help. Dakal's real mission can finally begin. Ready to face the worst, the Emerald Dragons leave Salvage and head to Shinra. On the other side of the gate lies the unknown, which probably includes overwhelming odds and almost certain death. It's just another day in the life of a merc. However, especially if you're Shinra's first heir. Gortal, still unaware of Dakal's continued existence, prepares to fight Ryun and retain his usurped throne. His plans will not be deterred, and his goals will be met. Before his time is through, the galaxy will again know and fear the mighty Shinegol Empire. As Dakal and company head through the Stargate, one thing is for sure. For every action, there are consequences. Will Gortal reap what he has sown, or will he finally defeat his older brother and take the Imperial throne for good? Awesome. And for those keeping score at home, consequences is the conclusion of the DeGaulle story from Nick Steverson. So uh, from what I understand, there's going to be more of that, but this will close out that particular story involving that set of characters. I know chat around fantasy is a lot of folks were looking forward to this one. So definitely go out and grab that. We'll drop you a link as we always do in the show notes. So it's one tap away from a purchase and you can go help the man out and read good story while you're at it. Uh, other stuff happening around CKP this week. We've got new stuff in audio in the form of mess with the bull. That is the eighth book in the 4HU Rise of the Peacemaker series from Casey Morse. Uh, go back about five or six episodes. We actually interviewed Casey to talk about that book. And he talked about a lot of the inspirations and stuff that, that went into making that story. Uh, Bull's fantastic character. 4HU fans know him well and for a reason because he's fantastic stuff. Uh, other things happening around the world of CKP launch team readers are needed for We Dare Wanted Dead or Alive. This is the fourth book in the We Dare or fourth anthology in the We Dare series featuring 15 never before seen stories stories from the likes of Jamie Ibsen, Chris Kennedy, and others. So again, go check that out as well. And if you want to be on the, uh, the launch team for that, go to chriskennedypublishing.com, click on the contact dust tab and shoot them a message, let them know, and they'll get you hooked up real quick in a hurry because that's what they do at chriskennedypublishing.com. You've got mail. All righty, time to give a uh, give a gander here at what the listeners have to ask us about this week and looking at things, lots of questions, uh, lots of questions about the USFL, lots of questions about the NFL draft coming up, and then questions about some of the other pop culture stuff that's been hopping around. Before we get to those, though, definitely want to give a big thanks to the folks at the International Association of Science Fiction and Fantasy Authors, IASFA, as they are called. It doesn't matter who you are, folks. If you're a reader, these are folks you want to know. If you're a writer, these are folks that you want to know. Uh, speaking of the latter, because that's kind of who we are, who we represent, IASFA is a great place to build community, guys. Go there, IASFA.org. Make sure you sign up for an account. It's free. And then just start getting to know people, right? There are communities of people in there who will help you out with your craft, help give you tips on book marketing, things of that ilk. Make yourself a better writer. Make yourself a better marketer of your stuff. Make some more money. It's always a good thing, right? Uh, if you're a reader, IASFA is constantly running book deals, all right? We just had a really, really big time military science fiction bundle that uh, that went out. We've got an urban fantasy book bundle that's going to be on the way, plus new anthologies that are exclusive to the association itself so that, uh, that you can get involved in. So again, go to the website, IASFA.org. Make sure you sign up for the mailing list so you can stay tuned on all of this stuff. 
And, uh, and stay in the know, man, because International Association of Science Fiction and Fantasy Authors, they take care of their people. Authors, readers, doesn't matter. They look out for everybody, and they are, again, good folks to know. All right, so first question comes to us from Stephen. Well, gentlemen, it's finally here. We've finally seen what the USFL 2.0 looks like in the wild. What were your big takeaways after opening weekend, and do you think this thing will actually stick? Uh, Rob, I'll start with you, man. We talked a lot about the USFL. Joe DeLeon from the NFL Draft Pros, uh, Prospects podcast came on, chatted a little bit about it. We finally seen this thing, man. After all the off the the pomp and circumstance, we finally seen what it looks like. So, what are your thoughts? Is this thing going to make it? Did it hit you? Did you think it fell flat? What'd you think? Well, it's hard to say if it's going to make it, but I, I suspect it it will, given some of the TV backing that it's got. Given that I believe a Fox is like it, Fox is the main shareholder, and NBC is already on board, and so on and so forth. I tell you, I watched the first two games. And I really enjoyed them. They were football. They were yeah. good football. Uh, was it as talented as you know watching uh, you know Tom Brady play or or you know Aaron Donald or anything like that? No, but and, and we saw that sort of on the first play. We sort of saw the best and the worst on the first play, which was a, a long throw, um, great catch by the receiver, but the, the receiver actually had gotten open and had the quarterback had a stronger arm. It's six. It's a walk-in six. However, that was still a really good football play to watch. It was sure. a heck of a catch. It was uh, – Tough kids, because I think at this point, if you're trying to to pound into a, a real NFL career at this this point, that every one of these kids is really going through some adversity to 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 claw their way into the NFL, and so a bunch of tough kids playing tough football and really putting their heart into it. And honestly, I'm a sucker for that kind of thing. I really enjoyed it. All righty, Todd, are you a uh, you a football fan? Did you give a chance to to check out the USFL this weekend? So yeah, I think I'm out of my depth here. I was I was a pretty big football fan about ten years ago, and I was really into uh, fantasy football. But okay. then um, my kids made me stop watching it because I screamed at the TV all the time, and and they didn't like that. So I put that on the shelf. So um, if you ask me about the USFL, I probably would say, so is that the one where Kurt Warner got his start? So yeah, <laughs> this, <laughs> we'll just move on from me. Fair fair enough, man. <laughs> I uh, I I like Rob enjoyed the USFL. I I don't know that I would go so far as to call. Like good football, I'll give it a solid B minus in terms of product on the field. But for crying out loud, guys, it's, a, it's the first game of a of a season with a league that's just starting out. These guys have been together for three weeks, four weeks, so all of that established. I I think they gave you as good a product as I honestly think you could expect out of them for week one. I'm definitely going to be interested to see where it goes from here. I, I think it definitely needs to pick up. Uh, particularly in in the quarterback realm, we all know in twenty twenty two quarterbacks what sells tickets, man. So in in the case of the XFL, you had Tamu, you had PJ Walker, guys who who really took off and established established themselves as the stars of that league. USFL is going to have to do the same thing. Uh, don't know that that's going to happen with a guy like an Alex Magoo, but um, but we can certainly watch and see. As a Noel, it was obviously awesome to see Reggie Northrup again uh, playing out there for Houston and, and showing up like he did for us and back in 2013. Um, there were some other guys in there that I think were a lot of fun. Uh, to Rob's point about whether or not it's going to stick, I do think it is going to stick at least for a couple of years. I've, I've read a few interviews with Daryl Johnston, formerly of the Dallas Cowboys, who's the executive VP of that league. Really smart guy. And I think they they have a model here that is built to not fail, hence why they're playing everything in Birmingham. That makes it a very cost-effective league to run in year one. There's no travel. There's no any of that. They put them up. They're going to play their games, and that's that. One thing they do need to do desperately, guys, pipe in some fake sounds, all right? Because when the Birmingham Stallions were on the field, great. You had 30,000, 40,000 fans in the stands, and it was cool. felt like a real game. When it rained on Easter Sunday and there were 200 people in the stands, come on, guys. We, we saw that fake fake noise and stuff can work with, with the pandemic. Let's break some of that back out of the bag and put that to use because you need that. But uh, but all in all, I was pretty happy with it. I'm interested to see where it goes. You guys know me. I'm a big proponent of affordable sports. I feel like leagues like the NFL and the NBA, uh, to a large degree, Major League Baseball, have really priced out the average fan. And I think things like minor league baseball, minor league hockey, now the USFL, you know what? You can actually afford to go sit in the stands with your kids and have a dog and a beer and watch it and enjoy it and root for your home team. And uh, and it be something a little bit beyond amateur sport. 
So I'm a fan of that. And for that reason, I hope whether it's the USFL or the XFL, I hope one of them stick. I really do. Because I think there's really a place right now for that. All right. Speaking of Reggie's, uh, our next question comes to us from a Reggie. Am I the only one who thought the Thor Love and Thunder trailer looked a little goofy? I get it that whimsical has kind of been the formula for a while now when it comes to this uh, character. But for crying out loud, man, it's like they're turning the God of freaking Thunder into a freaking middle aged punchline. Uh, any thoughts? What did you guys think of the new trailer? Todd, did you get a chance to check this one out when it hit uh, hit social media earlier this week? I did. My daughter brought it home to me. And What'd my, you think? My first thought was, okay, it's one of those trailers that I really can't tell whether this is going to potentially be a great movie or whether it's going to really suck. I mean, sometimes you get a trailer yes. that is just amazing, and yet you can see through the cracks of the amazing trailer and say, okay, I think they just told the whole story, and you know the movie's going to suck, right? And then sometimes you get a trailer that they didn't know how to put it together, but there's some really cool – things that happen and you're like, you know, that could be really good. And, and then it is this one's somewhere in the middle. Like I'm like, okay, there's some interesting pithy lines, but like you made note of, if that's all that's in the movie, then yeah, they've turned Thor into this middle-aged punchline. And I don't, I'm not going to like that. I know I'm not going to like that. Um, but if, if those were just the comedic moments and they just had, you know, not a really good balance of what, what's in the movie put into the trailer, then it could be really good. Being the optimist, I am holding out hope that it will be good. Um, but but I'm extremely leery. That was my takeaway from Fair. watching the trailer. Rob, how about you, man? Thor uh, Love and Thunder trailer. What'd you think? So I thought they tried to do too much. Uh, what I felt like when I got, looked at this trailer is, is that they couldn't find the soul of what make, whatever the story happens to be. And because they could never find the soul of the story, uh, they threw in this. Oh, we'll just add this because this would be okay. And, and, and so on and so forth. And as I was watching the trailer, I'm like, really? That seems like an odd story element to add. And that seems like an odd story. So I, I felt like there was a whole bunch of throwing um, stuff at the wall to see if it would stick. And Todd's right. Maybe it does work coherently uh, in in the movie and maybe the, the maybe so maybe the movie is so strong from start to finish in terms of the narrative that pulling anything out is just simply difficult because there's there's everything is contextually so strong next to each other but i didn't get that feeling i, I got the feeling of uh, the whimsical is a, a choice there but uh, but i i also got the feeling of they tried to do too much with the story because i don't know that I didn't ever got the feeling the writers actually grokked what they needed, like what the story was going to be. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, this one felt like a streamer to me. Um, obviously my wife loved it because guns and roses was in the trailer and that's like her <laughs> band. And let's face it, you can put sweet child of mine in pretty much anything and it's, it, you're going to put a fist in the air. Right. I mean, that's what that's there to do. So props to Marvel for, for good taste in music. Um, yeah, I, uh, man, I just, I feel like that Thor Ragnarok was really kind of the only Thor film you got where Chris Hemsworth really got to embrace the character. I thought the first Thor was okay. Dark World's one of the worst Marvel films of all time. Then you get Ragnarok, which I thought really leveled up. And then he went back to being kind of a side character with the Avengers. And now he's going to be a side character to Jane Foster, it would seem. Seem like that's kind of what they're setting up. And for those who know that storyline in the comics, that's would appear to be where this is headed. Um, if it's done well, then I think there's a lot of, lot of charm in this story to be done. But I don't know, man. And, and I know I've kind of beaten a drum here for people who listen to this show a lot. I said after Endgame... I don't know how Marvel tops that. I don't know how you go from here and continue to put stuff out that really keeps us coming back like we have to this point. And so far, I I haven't been. Like there've there have been a few moments here and there that I I really enjoyed and I thought were fun to 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 sit through, but by and large, I mean most of the post end game stuff for Marvel has felt very formulaic for me, and this very much felt like a Marvel formula trailer. Totally in every way. 
So yeah, uh, we, we yeah. shall see. But jury's out for me, and I don't. I won't roll into that one with a whole lot of expectations. Maybe I'll be proven wrong. Next question comes to us from Dimitri. Hey guys, new Eldros reader here. Happy to report that I've already cleared out all three of the novels and waiting for more. But I just have <laughs> one question: What's next for Kyvan the Unkillable? And Todd, I didn't want to spoil it earlier when you mentioned that you were working <laughs> on the sequel to that, but there was a question coming in pod mail for that. So fitting that you were here to answer that. What's next for Kyvan, man? Outstanding. Well, so um, in the Kyvan the Unkillable Noxanon uh, storyline, and of course, all these storylines are going to come together at a certain point. So um, next up in Eldros' Door into Winter, which is uh, written by Rob. So that I'm highly anticipating that one. But in the Kyvan storyline, uh, Laurel of the Dark is next. And uh, let's see if I can come up with my own little trailer for this one for you. Um, so essentially, we... Uh, Oh gosh, how am I going to do this without spoilers? So this one's going to be <laughs> a little bit more about Laurel, obviously, than Kyvan. Though we still get lots of good Kyvan action in there. Uh, the transformative character, as we've been talking about, the characters that you know, characters that transform, is going to be Laurel. And in this story, we don't just take brief trips into the Noctum. 60% of this novel takes place in the Great Noctum, 2,000 miles to the south. We go deep. We see uh, an entire culture that lives inside the Noctum. Um, we explore what that culture is like, and Laurel goes on a, an amazing, amazing journey. And of course, uh, because she is in danger in going on this journey. Kyvan and our merry troop of D&D type characters, Slater the Mage and Vaughn the Shadowvar, follow her into the Noctum. And uh, I don't want to spoil anything, but those of you who like um, fun side characters that are mages, Slater is uh, uh, at least... Uh, for the, I've got a couple of alpha readers reading this right now because um, the the entire novel is finished. Um, I got a couple of alpha readers reading it, and all indications are that Slater is a new <laughs> a new fan favorite. So, uh, anyways, um, that's that's my vague booking trailer of the of the book. Because if you haven't read Kaiden the Unkillable yet, well, first of all, what is wrong with you? But if you haven't read Kaiden the Unkillable yet, um, <laughs> you uh, you don't know where the story ends and therefore the next story begins. And if I if I tell that in detail, it's totally going to ruin something for Kaivin the Unkillable, and I don't want to do that. Fair enough. I want to touch base on something he did in Kaivin the Unkillable. I created a the, the magic system sort of originally and and um, for all of Eldros. And I, I built a particular style of magic called lore magic, and it was basically designed with the idea uh, – I, I, I built it because I wanted to have – librarians and I wanted to have researching and I wanted to have this kind of magic in there to let, you know, sort of the non heroic type characters get a chance to have heroic moments, uh, which is actually coming in, in my thread. I handed the magic system and, and all of the writers have done some interesting things with it that I, I didn't really expect, but Todd did something in particular that I thought was brilliant. The fighting style for Kaivan, he has the ability to sort of use this war magic to add to his fighting style in just the right moments to increase his odds in a given a given fight. It's not much. It's like in D&D &D terms, he's adding a plus one here or a plus one there to allow him to do something in the middle of the fight. But it's it's something I never thought of. And Todd's an amazing, amazingly creative writer. I remember reading the first, you know, when I edited, I remember reading that going, holy crap, what a fantastic idea. And I suspect that when I get a chance to edit uh, Lorella of the Dark, I'm going to be like, holy crap, what a fantastic fantastic idea man i hate this guy he's too smart for this group so you know i, I suspect i'll have that moment again awesome well speaking of kind of the unkillable folks since there's been obviously a lot of talk about that book in this episode we'll go ahead and throw a link to that one in the show notes as well so be sure you check that out tap it go buy it check it out and then you'll know what all the hubbub is about we're running tight on time so we're going to go ahead and get on to our last question on the night this one comes to us from ryan hey fellas i am stoked beyond words to finally be seeing one of my all-time favorite rock icons in concert this weekend in Jacksonville. That would be The Who. Uh, do you guys have any shows on tap for this summer? And if so, who and where do you plan to see them? Todd, you a concert goer? 
I, I not so much, but I am a music lover, so I'm familiar with the Who. Okay, um, <laughs> heard of those guys? Have you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, heard of them. They they did some th- things back in the seventies, didn't they? A little, little bit, yeah, a little bit. In in some <laughs> cop show where people wear sunglasses at night, you know. But never mind. <laughs> So, Rob, how about you, man? You uh, you got any shows on tap? I don't know that I have any shows on tap, but I literally, last night, uh, we're recording this on a Thursday, uh, the Wednesday of this week, I went and got to see Primus. Uh, Primus is a band I've been wanting to see for a long, long time. In fact, I've had tickets for this for two years, and then the pandemic sort of messed with everybody's schedule, of course. Uh, but this particular show was really important to me because Primus played all of Rush's A Farewell to King's album oh, wow. as a tribute to Rush and, and Neil after his death. And so I, I've been really wanting to see Primus live anyway, and this was a great chance. And Primus is an amazing band. It really an interesting show. They they do some neat stuff with their video. And the lighting was, was kind of funny in some ways. Uh, Les Claypool, if you're a fan of Primus, has a particular hat. Like, everybody knows the style of hat. And the way they lit it, I don't recall ever seeing his face lit up. But he was always in profile. So you always, you know, one of one of my iconic memories of the show is whatever video they had, um, his hat being in profile in front of it. I thought that was kind of fun. But they did a heck of a job playing the Rush stuff. It's not easy music. Sure, Xanadu is not an easy song, no, and, and, no, no. and a whole <laughs> so then they kicked it. And uh, you know, you got some of the favorites, like uh, you know, we noticed Big Brown Beaver and and uh, uh, Jerry was a race car driver, and then they also did one that they are actually releasing tomorrow, uh, which uh, I can't remember the title of, but it it was a, a, it's a long sort of xanadu like song and i i think it i think it's one of those songs i'm really gonna like down the road as i get used to hearing it so right. it was an exciting concert i don't have anything planned uh, right now um but i'm always kind of listening for when one of the bands uh, i i heard one that i i am kind of interested in um not a five finger death punch guy but they're playing i think with megadeth the who the other who the mongolian who hu and um, another band, Sort of Battles or something like that. Mm-hmm. And that show sounds really intriguing to me. They That's going to be playing in St. Louis. I don't have the date. Uh, so maybe go see, um, mostly going to see Megadeth and The Who. But I'm sure I'm going to enjoy Five Figure Death Punch too. Sure. Uh, so good maybe band. that one. Very good band. Um, did a great sticks cover, by the way, of I think it was Renegade a while back. It's really, really cool. Um, yeah, a little, little bit of music trivia for folks who don't know. Les Claypool was actually up for the bassist job in Metallica whenever Cliff Burton got killed. And uh, I remember watching that on Behind the Music years ago, and they they briefly touched upon that. And we're just like, man, that guy came in and he was awesome. But there was just no way that was going to fit. <laughs> we loved him, but we all knew right away this is just not going to mesh. And uh, and Primus came out of that, and we and they ended up with with Newstead. So good stuff there. Um, I don't have any big shows per se on my radar this summer. Uh, we're going to be not locked down, but fairly close to home. Uh, my wife is actually in the home stretch of finishing up her bachelor's degree online. She's got a pretty stacked summer. Uh, so that's probably after Liberty Con going to kind of keep us fairly pinned down so she can work on that. Um, there is a, a club over in Destin, Florida that I'm really excited to get over and check out called Club LA. Uh, folks who know Raleigh, the Raleigh area, the Ritz Lincoln Theater, sort of that type of a venue. You're going to get some smaller acts that will come through there, maybe some mid-listers at, at best. But a lot of tribute bands, and I'm a big fan of those, man. I used to go to Lincoln Theater in Raleigh all the time and pay 10 bucks and catch a triple header of tribute bands, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, same, same thing with the Ritz. A lot of value in that, and you get to go hang out with some friends, raise some glasses, drink some beers, sing some songs that everybody knows by heart, and it's just a great way to spend a night. So definitely, definitely looking forward to that. All right, speaking of things we're looking forward to, it's taking us down to White Flag. <laughs> White Flag is the segment where we all just kind of spout for a second on what we're looking forward to here in the next couple of days and weeks. It can be writing stuff. It can be convention stuff. It can be movie and music stuff for all we care. It can be anything. Rob, I'll start with you, man. What's on your radar in the next few days and weeks? Planet Comic Con. Awesome. 
Planet Comic Con. Have I mentioned Planet Comic Con yet? <laughs> I'm booth 1746 in Planet Comic Con. Please come by if you happen to be in the Kansas City area. I am so stoked to be a part of another show. It's been too long to have these kind of shows. They're they're always interesting in part because you get to see so much creative stuff in the costuming and there's such a an energy with all these people coming around and, and doing fun stuff and so many creative I mean, all these authors who've done great stuff that I'm like, oh, I never thought about doing it, stuff like that. And, and of course, the art and stuff like that. It's always such a vibrant thing. And I come out of these these big cons like this with a lot more energy and excitement for what I'm doing. Cool. Todd, how about you, man? What's on your radar in the next couple of days or next couple of weeks that you're looking forward to? Planet Comic Con. I've heard of that. <laughs> Somebody mentioned that to me once. Uh, yeah, I'll just riff off what uh, what Rob said. Planet Comic Con. This is my second year. Last year was my my inaugural year to come to Planet Comic Con, and it rocked. I had a banner con, and um, so it's a really great con. Lots of fantastic fans there, and I, I just I've done a lot of cons at this point, and um, this is one of the best. And I just love the the um, the atmosphere of cons in general. People going to express themselves, uh, you know kind of put their geek on parade, you know, um, for all the things that they really, really love. And, and they get to come to this place where not only will they not get looked down upon for, you know, wearing whatever character costume that they want, but they get, you know, lauded for it. They get appreciated for it. And it's just such a great and special atmosphere to be there. And I just, I feel honored every time I come to one of these things um, and I get to sell my stories and get to talk about my stories. Cause that's pretty much what I do all day long. Somebody comes up to my booth and I say, want to hear about a book? And if they say yes, then I give them the hook for one of my stories. And it's usually like, you know, 60 seconds to 30 seconds long. And um, if they are a potential fan, their eyes light up and there is no better feeling in all the world. And I will talk and talk and talk and hook and hook and hook for the entire thing. And I've lost my voice multiple times. There is actually a dark magic that you can implement to uh, bring your voice back once you've lost it. Uh, it there is a price though. Like I said, it's dark magic. So there is a price. Uh, that would have been uh, good to have around karaoke night at Fantasy in Durham about like a month ago. Next day yes. was brutal. <laughs> Do you want to know what the dark magic is? Shall I reveal it here on the podcast? What is the dark magic, sir? A shot of apple cider vinegar. Oh, that I was... kid you not. Oh, Oh, it that's hurts. really taking one for the team there. Oh, it hurts all the way down. You're going to have an upset oh. stomach for about 45 minutes. Oh. Your voice comes back. I oh. kid you not. Felt that one all the way down in the cockles, <laughs> as they say. Yes. <laughs> Dark uh, magic always has a price. <laughs> uh, on my radar and much happier things, I'm looking forward to the unbearable weight of massive talent. I have no idea, speaking of trailers that really did it right, that one grabbed me right out of the gate. Far be it from me to be like, I have got to see a Nicolas Cage movie. Anybody who's followed that, guy career, that guy's career of late, you don't say that. But this one, this looks absolutely out of sight. Uh, if you haven't seen it, go online, hit YouTube, uh, look up the trailer for it. Again, it's called The Unbearable uh, Weight of Massive Talent. Long and the short of this film is Nicolas Cage is, is playing himself. And he is a washed up actor who gets hired to go do a, a you know, a, a meet and greet at some really, really rich dude who's a super fan's house. And he has to like go to a suck up his pride and go do this to get paid because he's down <laughs> on his luck. And it's just everybody's forgotten over the years that Nick Cage does great comedy. And that's what this is. And so it's Nick Cage and it's Pedro Pascal from The Mandalorian. And it just looks like it is going to be an absolute gas. And I don't know about you guys, man, but I'll take a good comedy all day long these days because, frankly, they're not that easy to come by anymore. So, again, uh, unbearable weight of massive talent with Nick Cage and Pedro Pascal. Looks like it's going to be freaking hysterical. Uh, looking forward to trying to check that out. And then coming up uh, between now and the next time we meet again, folks, uh, the Mrs. and I are taking off out of Dodge and going on a little cruise to celebrate our 10-year wedding anniversary. So, jacked for that. Going to be sitting on a boat in the Caribbean while the mother-in-law is here at the house with the kiddo. And uh, having a little Bloody Mary by morning and a nice cold beverage in the evening over a bar somewhere and catch shows and doing all the good things you do on cruises and eating a freaking ton. So so, so we 
we really need you to record, you know, like uh, a section for, for the next podcast, you know, while you're really, really drunk after. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. Hard, hard to, hard to get that far down the buzz wagon whenever you're eating that much food. I mean, seriously, if you've never been on a cruise, be prepared to eat, dude, big time. (laughs) Yeah. So so next time Ian's going to waddle into the studio. (laughs) Pretty, pretty much. Yeah. Pizza the hut. (laughs) Sorry. Spaceballs reference had to get it in there. All righty. Well, thanks so much again to Todd Fonestock for coming on the show tonight, filling in for Kevin Steverson. Kev, man, drive safe. Say hi to the family for us. Uh, definitely wishing you well and, and looking forward to seeing you back next time. Thanks as always to Rob Howell for tagging along on the show. Thanks to you guys, the listeners, man. We love that you love us. We really, really do. If you want to show that you love us, though, just saying, just putting it out there, go onto your favorite podcasting platform. And if it'll let you leave five stars in a review, we'd really appreciate that. Helps to bump us up in the rankings, help other people find us that may not be looking for us. YouTubers, like it, smash it, subscribe to it. All those wonderful terms that an old fart like me doesn't have a clue what they mean, but they sound good. So go do that. Uh, thanks as always to Chris Kennedy Publishing for sponsoring the show. Thanks to the IAS for folks for sponsoring the pod mail segment. And um, holy cow, I think I'm out of steam. So I'm going to shut up now and start counting down to my cruise. Love you guys. Y'all take it easy. Have a great night. We'll see you around.